Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am Zach Peterson, your host and your local technical consultant for Altium. And today we're gonna talk about PCB noise reduction techniques. So what do we mean by noise reduction? Well, there's all sorts of different types of noise that can arise in your PCB. We're gonna talk about a few of those and three specific strategies that are often brought up to try and reduce all these different types of noise. These are filtering, adding shielding, and something called isolation. Now I know isolation sounds pretty vague, but that's all the stuff that we're gonna talk about in this video. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so when we talk about noise reduction in the PCB, the term noise is pretty ambiguous. It could mean a lot of different things. It could mean crosstalk, so like signal to signal noise. It could mean some other form of electromagnetic coupling, which is usually something like power to signal noise. It could mean radiated emissions or reception of external radiated emissions. It could be conducted emissions all sorts of different things. There are even thermal effects that produce noise, and that's something that's a little more advanced and goes back to you know, what happens inside of components. But what we wanna do is actually look at some of these strategies that are usually brought up as like cure-alls for different kinds of noise. So some of these noise reduction strategies will include, number one, filtering. So. When we talk about filtering, we're usually talking about literally a circuit that filters stuff. Filter circuit, sometimes something as simple as just an EMI filter like a ferrite bead is usually brought up as a cure-all for all these different types of noise. So you have to be careful with filtering because you wanna pair up the filter that you're gonna use with the specific noise that you want to eliminate while also not affecting the signal that is carrying the noise with it. So this is not a cure-all, it's something that you have to very precisely plan for and that's something that we'll talk about here coming up. The next common noise reduction strategy that people like to bring up is something called shielding. So. I think if you ask 10 different designers what shielding is, you'll probably get about 10 or 20 different answers. So most people, when they refer to shielding, they're probably referring to a Faraday cage, meaning they're basically just gonna put a bunch of metal around the problem circuit and they're gonna ground it and then that's going to basically eliminate the noise. And that's essentially the idea. Now there are components and materials that you can use to provide shielding in your PCB. And we'll discuss when those are you know, basically relevant and what types of noises they deal with. The third is something called isolation. Now, this is even more vague than shielding. So isolation is usually brought up in the context of mixed signal design. And we've talked about mixed signal design before, when you basically have different frequencies or digital and analog signals on the same board, and you wanna make sure that they don't interfere with each other. So isolation refers to those strategies, and we'll get into those last, because frankly, that's the easiest one to deal with, and we'll talk about that more here soon. So first things first, filters. When should you use filters? Well, filters should really only be used when dealing with analog stuff, okay? You should not use filters with digital stuff unless your filters have very high roll off, which is generally not gonna be the case. Filters are generally used to target low frequency analog or you'll have specialized filters with like 50 ohm input impedance that will be used for RF uh, signal chains. So filters are useful, but they're best for analog stuff. And here's the reason why. So generally, when we talk about filters, we talk about a transfer function. And if you graph a transfer function for a filter, H, it's gonna be as some function of frequency. And there will be some curve here, okay? and. Let's just take a low pass filter just as an example. This transfer function basically looks like this. Now the transfer function tells you the output versus the input voltage, and that's equal to my transfer function as a function of frequency. So what this is telling you is that if I have a signal and it's operating at this frequency, F1, and let's just say it's just a spike here. So it's just this one signal operating at F1. What this transfer function is telling you is that it's gonna allow all of the power in F1 to reach the destination. Now, everything above this F3dB roll off, 
everything above that is going to get heavily attenuated and will essentially get removed from the interconnect. And so the point of drawing out a transfer function is to tell you that this is not a, you, you can't just pick random filters and pair them up with your particular uh, interconnect and then expect to remove every noise source. So you should actually look at what the noise is on an oscilloscope or even better on a network analyzer or on a signal analyzer and you can actually pick out the frequencies that you need to eliminate. So if you just want to transfer one specific frequency down an interconnect, maybe you have a driver component and you have your trace and then you have your receiver Somewhere along this trace, it's picking up some noise. So if you already know the frequencies involved in this noise source, then you can design a filter and put it somewhere here, usually near the receiver, for this signal that is going to only allow this signal while removing this particular noise source. So your filter options are usually something like a notch filter that's gonna remove specific frequencies. You could also have a band pass filter, so meaning it's only going to allow the frequency that you want, so in this example F1, while removing everything else. You could also have a band stop filter, so maybe just in this example you have another frequency F2 that's originating from your noise source and reaching your trace. And then in that instance the band stop filter could target F2 while having zero attenuation at F1. Filters are useful for targeting specific frequencies. Now, if this were, say, a digital interconnect, and we had a signal that was a digital signal and it's traveling this direction from the driver to the receiver, well, should we use filtering? Well, the answer is no. We actually shouldn't be using any kind of filters. The reason we shouldn't be using any kind of filters is because generally with filtering components that are operating in practical frequency ranges, you're actually going to attenuate a lot of this digital signal and you could distort it to the point where it doesn't trigger the receiver properly. And the reason for that is because a digital signal does not have all of its power concentrated at one frequency. Its power is actually concentrated, well, theoretically, all the way out to infinity. Usually the cutoff for our digital signal bandwidth is going to be very high. And so we've talked about this before that actually relates to the rise time. So if you go back and watch one of our videos on digital signal bandwidths, we'll put the link in the description, that will tell you why the power spectrum of a digital signal spans out so far into the high frequency range and you can't remove high frequency noise with something like a low pass filter as I've shown here. Next, shielding. What exactly is shielding? Well, shielding, as I said before, is pretty much anything that you can use to create essentially the equivalent of a Faraday cage around your components. Now, no Faraday cage is perfect, and you could basically go, you know, just as heavy as you want and make a totally enclosed, you know, shielded metal enclosure around your board and to try and eliminate any sources of outside noise. And you could do that, but you may not be successful. There are actually other things that you'll want to do in your PCB rather than just defaulting to shielding to try and solve all your noise problems. So just as an example, let's take a look at our cross section of a PCB. And let's just say for a moment that I have an integrated circuit here and it's receiving a lot of noise from some outside source. Well, the guys that claim that you should always use shielding around these types of components will basically put some vias around here and what they'll do is they'll go find a big metal shielding can that basically encloses this entire component. And so the idea here is that if this component is emitting a lot of noise, the shield is then going to block this. And then what they'll do is they'll attach this to some pads, they'll connect it to ground, usually on the next layer, and then that basically creates a totally enclosed uh, cage that prevents any noise from escaping this component and possibly reaching other circuits. Vice versa, it also prevents any noise from out here from entering inside the cage up to very high frequencies and then interfering with any of the operation of this component or any of the other connections that it makes that are inside of this cage. So that's kind of the idea behind shielding. And people will go to you know various lengths to try and create a similar structure 
around different elements in a PCB. So if you've seen any of my presentations on high frequency design, one structure that I describe is actually called a substrate integrated waveguide, where you essentially shield a signal inside to the substrate by enclosing it on all four sides with copper planes and vias. It's essentially the same thing as like a grounded coplanar waveguide. Coplanar waveguides, speaking of the devil, do the exact same thing. So let's say that you have your PCB here and you wanna create a coplanar waveguide. Well, what you do is you basically have a trace being routed like this. You have some copper pour. This is ground. This is ground. And then you have a bunch of vias lined up along here. This essentially creates some shielding by enclosing this trace as much as possible by grounded copper. So that if there's any noise that comes in here, it is very difficult for this noise to induce a signal inside of this trace and create some noise that then gets read out by a receiving component. So that's kind of the idea behind shielding is basically to just block noise. The reality is that shielding is kind of seen as one of those things that you are just gonna have to do on some components, and that's not really true. If you do the layout correctly, usually you don't have to do things like adding these shielding cans. And there are variations of shielding cans that you can actually implement on the enclosure not just on the PCB. So there are different shielding materials like meshes that you can put inside your device enclosure. Um, there are like shielding compounds or gaskets that will absorb electromagnetic radiation and will prevent it from entering or leaving the enclosure. Those are other options. All of that stuff is useful in different contexts, but you should always start by creating the board correctly first. And if you do that, then you're gonna eliminate the need for shielding. So when I say create the board correctly or create the stack up correctly, what exactly does that mean? Well, let's just look at an example here. Let's say that this is our noisy component or our noisy circuit. Let's say it's a power, uh, power regulator. And we've got another trace over here. And this trace is receiving some noise from this circuit. Well, there are a few things that you can do to try and reduce how much noise couples from this circuit over to this trace that don't involve putting any shielding around here. So one option, if we don't have this shielding, is to reduce the coupling strength between these two circuits, right? So we'll have some C sub M here, so that's our mutual capacitance, and then some L sub M, that's our mutual inductance. So we've got two levers that we can pull to try and eliminate the noise coupling between these two circuits. Those are, number one, to take the distance here, so D, and increase it. So spacing things out is always gonna reduce noise, every single time. It will always reduce the noise that gets coupled from here over to here. So that's your first lever you can pull, is just space stuff out. The other thing that you can do is if you have a ground plane on the next layer, which you usually should, you can take this height, so this distance between the trace and the ground plane, and you can reduce it, okay? So bring the ground closer to the trace that's being affected, and that will also reduce these uh, parasitic capacitance and parasitic inductance values. So just recently we did another video on parasitics where we actually looked at a graph that shows what happens when you take this, uh, this ground plane and you move it closer to the circuit that's being affected by noise. It actually reduces these coupling uh, capacitances and inductances, and that's gonna reduce the strength of noise that couples from this circuit over to this circuit. Now, let's just suppose that the noise source over here that you're about to couple into this trace here is at a specific frequency. So maybe this, instead of a power regulator, is some sort of analog circuit. And the analog signal is harmonic, so it's operating at a single frequency. So what you could do is you could put stitching vias around this circuit. So putting stitching vias around this trace is effective if the vias are sized properly. So don't just pick some random value like, you know, two millimeter spacing or whatever and expect that that's always gonna work for every frequency. So we discussed in a previous video the role of stitching vias in copper pour and how they can actually contribute to resonances that aid noise transfer between two circuits or how they suppress resonances and prevent noise transfer between these two circuits. And so they do that by creating a resonant cavity between them. So let's just say for a moment that I've got two vias here, 
and they're separated by some distance s. Whenever s is equal to half a wavelength, where this wavelength is the wavelength inside of this particular structure associated with the decay of the substrate, then you will have a strong resonance that builds up in this cavity, and that strong resonance could aid noise transfer into this interconnect, which could then get read out by the receiving component. So what exactly is the wavelength that we're talking about here, the half wavelength? Well, if you remember your uh, basic physics, the speed of light inside of the substrate here is just the speed of light in vacuum divided by the refractive index or the square root of dk. And then that is equal to the wavelength inside of this structure multiplied by the frequency. So if we just substitute in lambda equals 2s into this equation, we get f times 2s is equal to c sub zero over square root of dk. Solve for f. I get f is equal to 2s square root of dk in the denominator divided by speed of light in vacuum. Okay, so you can look this up in any old textbook. s is something that you chose when you set up your stitching vias. dk, that's just the dielectric constant for your, uh, for your substrate material. So this tells you the frequency that is going to build up a strong resonance between these two vias. And so you would like to prevent that because whenever you have a strong electric, uh, electric and magnetic field built up inside this structure, that strong field could then couple noise into a nearby interconnect, and that's going to actually increase noise transfer between these two circuits. So if you space this out properly, you will actually prevent all lower level frequencies, so frequencies less than this, from building up these strong resonances and then coupling noise into this circuit. All right, last but not least, isolation. So what does isolation mean? Well, let's just look at an overhead view of a PCB, just kind of as an example. I could have, let's say, a circuit here, and I wanna prevent it from coupling any noise into a nearby integrated circuit and all of its traces and everything. Isolation says that you essentially prevent the return path associated with any of the traces and any of the signals moving around in this circuit from interfering with the return paths of, let's say, this circuit over here. So this is essentially the counterpart of noise coupling that I was referring to when we were talking about shielding. Now, generally when people talk about isolation, this is where you're gonna see that you know 30 year old design guideline come up that says you should start splitting up ground planes. And I still to this day see new articles coming out that say you should split up ground planes in order to prevent isolation from, let's say a signal over here, from creating a return path that then interferes with a different signal over here. It is true that you do wanna prevent the return paths from appearing to superimpose on each other and then create noise transfer between these circuits. However, splitting up the ground plane and doing something like this is really not the right way to do it. So the issue here is that you need to take note of where your return paths exist and prevent return paths from crossing each other. So just as an example, you know, if I have a return path that exists here and I have another return path that exists here along a circuit, it's possible that if there's no ground plane or any ground separating these, that the signals could couple noise into each other and you essentially have a form of crosstalk that would then be read out at whatever IOs you're dealing with. That's essentially what could happen in this circuit. And basically just changing the layout is probably gonna fix this problem. So maybe moving this over, moving this up, and then re-engineering where you put the actual I.O. port or whatever the receiving component is that needs to interact with these two chips, that is actually gonna solve this problem for you without having to do anything like splitting up a ground plane. So pretty simple. I've been told in the past that I talk a little too much about not splitting up a ground plane. And for most designs, you don't need to split up a ground plane, especially if you're dealing with the standard set of digital buses. So let's say you're doing like a microcontroller board, you need to access the SPI, I2C, UART, whatever other standard digital buses are on there. So if you're dealing with that case, save yourself a lot of headache, go with a solid ground plane, don't try and split it up, and 
practice good layout practices and learn how to track return paths and you're gonna be in good shape. You're gonna, you're gonna prevent a lot of your noise problems. Now, there are some specialty cases where you actually might need to split up the ground plane because the frequencies involved are such that that is the only way you're gonna be able to provide any kind of isolation. So I'll give you one great example that I was just recently reminded about from someone that works at another company, which is precision DC measurements. So with pre highly precise DC measurements, Again, in that case, the return paths are such that you actually kind of have no choice. You may have to split up the ground planes in order to provide the isolation you need. Some audio systems, it's actually desirable to do this because they may have a digital section on the front end and that's what the user interacts with and there's gonna be the standard digital buses. Those could then couple noise into your audio section. Those audio frequencies are such that they need to be confined from the digital stuff and one of the easy ways to do that is by splitting a ground plane. However, those are the exceptions, those are not the rule. Give yourself a reason to split the ground plane if you think you need to do it. Come up with a compelling reason and then do it. Don't split it first and try and find a reason to use a full ground plane. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in and hopefully this gives you some strategies that you can think about to deal with your own noise problems in your PCB should you ever find them. Now, one thing I didn't mention, which I probably should have mentioned at the beginning, is if you do have noise problems, try and track down what the actual source is. That's going to give you a reference to try and figure out how you can actually approach this and what strategy is gonna be best for your specific noise problem. All right, thanks again, everybody. Leave us a comment in the comment section. Leave your questions in the comment section. Send your questions off to YouTube at allteam.com. Hit that subscribe button. And finally, don't forget to call your fabricator, everybody.